Good afternoon. I'd like to start by showing you a couple of photographs from our family album. This is a photograph of my daughter Jessica, who as you can see is a keen soccer player, and really she's been a soccer player since a very early age. So, and she specialized as a goalkeeper from very early on. Now soccer, as Tim said, is a truly beautiful game. It's free-flowing, unlike the major American sports, for example, and there's only one set piece, and that set piece is the penalty kick, which as the parent of a soccer player and of a goalkeeper in particular makes one particularly anxious. And so if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of that photograph, you'll see my wife, Linda, and you can see it's plainly obvious that she's extremely anxious. Now, here's a shot of Jessica facing a penalty kick. This is not working. There we go. And as you can see, she stopped the penalty kick. And of course, I'd never show you a photograph of a daughter of mine letting in a penalty kick. But the truth is that the odds are against the penalty kicker. In general, about three quarters or 75% of penalty kicks go in. Let me show you the facts. The reason is that the ball is placed 12 yards from the goal line, and once the kicker kicks the ball, it travels at about 80 miles an hour which means that there's 300 milliseconds for the goalkeeper to react, which is far too little time to react, so goalkeepers tend to choose ahead of time whether to dive left or to dive right. And if you look at how much they dive each way, you'll see that they dive left 57% of the time and right 41% of the time. The difference is because most penalty kickers are right-footed and they prefer kicking to the left. But that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that 57 plus 41 equals 98. So the question is, what happens the rest of the time? The rest of the time, they don't dive either left or right, which if you're a penalty kicker, ought to give you a clue, because maybe you can be even more successful if you kick the ball straight down the center. Because chances are, 98% chance, you're not going to find the goalkeeper in your way. Yet, and it's true, by the way, it's 7% more likely. So your odds of success as a penalty kicker go up from 75% to 82%. But the mystery is that only 17% of goal kicks are kicked to the center. All the rest, the remaining 83% are kicked to the side. Far less than is optimal. Why is that? If I show you a payoff matrix, it's even more Mysterious, because the penalty kicker can kick to the center and have an 82% chance of glory, or kick to the side and have a 75% chance of glory. They tend to kick to the side too frequently. The reason is the other side of the payoff matrix, because if they kick to the side and they miss, it's disappointing. They'll have a bad evening, but it's not humiliating. If they kick to the center, it's absolutely humiliating. And don't just take my word for it. I looked up some of the commentaries around World Cup games, and I'll read you a couple of them. Here's when the ball was saved, but they kicked to the side. Brilliantly saved against the Netherlands' Wesley Snyder. Or Bonetta hit the crossbar. Contrast that with what happens when they kick to the center. Ricardo Cabanas looked almost amateurish on his shot directly into the middle of the goal and then again right at the goalkeeper. That was between Switzerland and the Ukraine. Or, Marco Strela's effort for Switzerland was worse, low and directly at the goalkeeper. So, it's entirely rational that goal kickers would choose to kick to the sides, not to the center, but nonetheless, it's a breakdown in teamwork. It's a breakdown in cooperation, because what they are doing is risking their team's chance of success. They're lowering their team's chance of success in order to meet their own individual goals. That's a breakdown in cooperation. And cooperation is the central concept of teamwork. Teamwork is what makes teams function effectively. It's what makes one plus one equals three. It's what makes the whole greater than the sum of the parts, and it's a breakdown. 
Here's how we define cooperation, the most important concept. It's acting in ways that improve effectiveness of others. If that's what's happening in a team, then you get teamwork. If that's not happening in a team, then you're not getting teamwork. And in order to study this concept, we wanted to find a sports team at the professional level that truly outperformed in a way that was sustainable over a significant period of time, because we wanted a laboratory in which to test what it is that allowed that team to achieve superior levels of cooperation. And here's the team we found. The United States national women's soccer team in the 1990s is arguably the most successful professional sports team of all time. How successful? Well, they had an 86% winning ratio through that period of time. That means that they won 155 games over the decade, they lost just 25 and they drew nine. Now, if you compare that to the Boston Red Sox, for example, who last week won the World Series, which, for those of you who don't know, the World Series is an entirely American baseball competition. <laughs> and they are, they regard, the New, the New York Times called them the greatest baseball team of all times because they won 108 games through the season. But that translated into a 67% winning ratio. If you look across all the major American sports over the last several years, the most successful was last year the, the Golden State Warriors, a basketball team. They had an 82% winning ratio, which is a full 25% less than these women. And these women did it for a decade, not just a year. They also won two World Cups and the inaugural Olympic Games. And what's more, not only did they beat their opponents, they absolutely crushed their opponents. Their average winning margin was three goals. And they did it by harnessing the power of cooperation more effectively than anyone else. So we wanted to understand what it was about, and we teamed up with a panel of key personalities from that team. Anson Dorrance and Lauren Gregg, who are coaches. Carla Overbeck and Julie Fowdy were captains of that team. Michelle Akers was the star striker, and Tiffany Roberts was one of the key reserves. And what we found is that they found ways to harness cooperation through a set of principles that we call the six simple rules. And here's what they are. All they are, all the six simple rules are, is a set of principles drawn from game theory that improve one's ability to create a context in which people cooperate. And there's six of them, but they're divided into three and three, as you can see. Because in order to cooperate, you need to both want to cooperate, you need to have the desire to cooperate, and you need to be empowered to operate. You need to be able, you need to be enabled to cooperate. And so if you look at the rules on the left-hand side, the three on the left-hand side, those are really about empowerment, those are about giving people the ability to cooperate, and the ones on the right-hand side are all about creating the context where people have the desire to cooperate. They are impelled to cooperate. Now, how did this team do it? Well, perhaps the strongest driver of cooperation on the team was the higher calling or purpose or mission that they set for themselves. Now, I'm sure many of you know that in a time of crisis, say an environmental crisis or a terrorist attack, cooperation automatically increases. And there's no mystery why that's the case. Reciprocity is increased automatically because people understand that their fate and that their success is mutually tied together, and the shadow of the future is extended because the consequences of people's actions are brought closer in and are made more vivid. Now, higher calling works in much the same way, and this team had two. The first was that they set out not just to win soccer games or football games, but they set out to empower women through sports and achieve gender equality. When they played games, they were playing not just for themselves, but they were playing for all the young aspirin soccer players, including my daughter, Jessica. And they had a second calling, which was they wanted not just to beat their opponents, but to absolutely dominate and crush them. <laughs> this is a concept that Anson Dorrance 
their first and most famous coach brought to the team. And he lived abroad for many years of his childhood, and he developed a chip on his shoulder, a grudge, as we heard yesterday. He developed a grudge that there was a lack of respect for U.S. soccer in the rest of the world, and this was his opportunity for payback. And there was one simple tactic that they had to achieve that. They were going to double every single player on the opposing team. In other words, two players on the US team were going to mark every single player on the opposing team. But you can imagine the amount of engagement and fitness and commitment that such a strategy would need. Here's what Michelle Akers said about their higher calling. When we played, we played to grow the game. We did it intentionally. We wanted to expand, expand what people felt was possible for women. So through this, through this higher calling, they increased reciprocity because it was audacious enough that it became rational for the players on the team to subsume their own interests in support of the broader interest of the team. It's what caused Michelle Akers to suffer no fewer than 30 orthopedic procedures and keep coming back and playing. And when we asked her about it, because that's an absolutely remarkable thing to do, she responded simply, that was my role on the team. I was the target, I was going to get hit, and I had to draw other players so that my team could do a good job. It also expanded the shadow of the future, because if a player on a team didn't give her all, not only did she risk that particular game, but she risked tarnishing the image of women in sports, which is the very thing that this team set out to accomplish. Now, a higher calling is only relevant if it's brought into by every single player on the team. And coaches Greg and Dorrance realized from a very early stage that while it's easy to motivate the star players on the team, it's not so easy to motivate those who sit on the bench, the reserves. It's much the same in business. Many companies have great missions, but for the scores and scores of middle and frontline managers performing menial tasks, their work seems fairly meaningless and completely unconnected to the mission of that organization. And so they developed a strategy which they called engaging the 20th player. And they did that because at the time, international rules of soccer were such that there were 20 players on a squad, uh, there were 20 players on a squad, so that the last player on the team was the 20th player, and they had a few tactics to accomplish this. The first was that they elevated the role of practices relative to games. For them, a practice, a game, I should say, was nothing more than the outcome of what occurred to the for, for the team in practice. And they made a big point of praising players for elevating practice in games. The second thing they did was share credit. As Michelle told us, when she scored a game-winning goal, which was not an uncommon event for her, they gave as much praise to the player sitting on the bench who was responsible for keeping her hydrated as they did to herself. Now, that may seem crazy, but it extended to such an extent on this team that there was a running joke. They called themselves a bunch of socialists for just how much they shared credit amongst the players. Now, even with a high degree of reciprocity and a, and, and, and a significantly extended shadow of the future, you still don't get full cooperation unless a couple of other conditions apply. The most important is that you need to understand what people really do and why. Because if you don't understand what people really do and why, it's hard to know how to cooperate them. It's hard for fellow players to know what to do to effectively improve their effectiveness. And it's also hard for leaders and coaches on the team to know how to reward those who cooperate. And again, they had a number of tactics whereby they achieved it. The first was that they made a big point in pregame, oh, and by the way, this, they had a name for this. They called it walking in one another's shoes. But first of all, in pre-game meetings, they made a point of going through every single player and talking about how their role, no matter how seemingly insignificant, tied to the overall mission of the team. 
because every player was there for a reason. The second is that they created small societies. Now, small societies were groups of players on the team who had to work together particularly closely. For example, the attacking front six or the defending four. And they'd give them a set of objectives that they could only achieve together. For example, they might say to the defending four that their job would be, or one of their objectives would be to keep an opposing attacker out of the penalty box during a penalty kick. My personal favorite was a small society called the Leaders of the Bench. Their role was to keep the players hydrated while they were on the field. And then the third tactic they employed, which literally was about walking in one another's shoes, was the notion of playing in others' positions during practice. And they had a very common philosophy of making them play in, in, one, in different positions in practice. And even when they were significantly up during a game, the coaches would get them to switch positions so they got a better understanding of what it's like to do so. Much the same as job rotations in the business world, those can be highly effective at building te teamwork amongst people. Now, the level of cooperation that this team achieved may well have saved them in the 1999 World Cup. Because in the quarterfinals, they faced Germany, which was their arch rival, and early on in the game, this is what happened. Brandy Shastain, one of the defenders, attempted a routine pass back to Brianna Scurry, who was the goalkeeper, but instead of being safely caught by the goalkeeper, the ball squirted past her and ended up in the net. But everyone on the panel who vividly remembered the moment said, it didn't make the team fall apart. That's what could happen in a team of me too, of me first players. What happened on this team is it merely rallied them. The very first thing that Captain Overbeck did was she went over to Brandy Shustain, not to berate her, but to say to her, look, what's done is done. We need you now more than ever. And as it turns out, Brandy Shustain scored the equalizing goal in halftime. The US went on to win the game, went on two rounds later to play against China in the finals in Pasadena, California, in what to this day is the most watched soccer game, women's soccer game in history, women's sporting event in history, in fact. And it was Brandy Shastain who scored perhaps the most iconic goal in the history of that sport to win the game for the women. Thank you.